Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Raw Talks podcast with me, Simban Mark, here from Living with the Spirit, and special guest returning to the podcast, Dr. David Bertelli. Now, I, I remember I was going to ask Simba to introduce. That's okay. <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> welcome back, David. So good to see you. Thank you. Good to be back. I love all the smiles. It'll be fun. Yeah, this is going to be so much fun. We're going to deep dive into the rabbit hole of post-traumatic growth. This is, yeah, we're super excited about this. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to hand it over to you, David. Okay, great. I want to talk about some of the areas of post-traumatic growth that are not spoken about very often, which I think are really valuable. And many people have the experiences but they're not often invited to share at that depth of the experience. And so they kind of lose the validity and the value of a deep transformation that comes in the post-traumatic growth process. So that's where I want to go today. And, and it will challenge some people a little bit, but I think that's really useful for us to do that. So I'll give my presentation and then afterwards we'll have a dialogue about it so that we can enjoy the, the movement back and forth of consciousness and ideas around the experiences of post-traumatic growth as a human species, actually. So let me give you a little presentation of the direction that I'm thinking and the experiences I had that caused me to create these PowerPoints. Okay, so... We can see here, here's our baseline before trauma occurs to us. Now, when trauma happens, what we do is we naturally activate our sympathetic nervous system. We try to run away from the trauma or we try to fight the trauma. If those don't work, we will go into some sort of panic or rage or some kind of intense emotions, anger, terror, fear, rage. We go into those emotions to try to survive. If they do not work, that's when the sympathetic nervous system turns off and the dorsal vagal parasympathetic nervous system turns on, which creates the freeze response or what we call the immobility, numbness or dissociation response. Now that's a temporary response of the nervous system to help us survive the threat but we are not designed to live in that state. And unfortunately, many people, particularly those who have been traumatized in early childhood, end up living in that state and that exhausts the nervous system. However, we have a great nervous system and when we reach a place of safety, our nervous system by its own nature will try to come back down to the baseline which is the ventral vagus nervous system, which is calmness and relaxation. But if you had this experience, let's say as a child, there was never a time when you were safe again anymore. So the brain never turned off. It always stayed activated here. Also, if you're in an abusive relationship, if you're in living in domestic violence or political violence, war, natural disaster, Sometimes we stay up in this part of the nervous system for days or years before we turn off. Now, there's problems up here, but I want to try to explain there are two major areas that we go through to try to actually recover from traumatic experiences. So the first one is this area up here. We come out of freeze, but when we come out of freeze, what we do is we meet the emotions that we had before we went into freeze. So what happens is we come out of freeze, which we need to do, but then we're met with very overwhelming emotions. And so what happens is we wanna go back into freeze again, because we have no feeling up here. This is why we would use drugs or alcohol or some sort of substance to numb us back out again. And when that substance wears off, and we start to come back down again, then we feel overwhelming feelings and we get caught in this cycle. 
This is the first cycle of trying to recover from trauma, and it's a difficult one. In this cycle, when we have no feelings up here, we have feelings of like loneliness, isolation, suicide, discouragement, agitation. We feel something going on inside of us. These are internal emotions, okay? The overwhelming emotions cause to have external aggression, such as anger, violence, attack, defense behaviors. So we actually vacillate back and forth between these two. This is stage one of recovery. What happens when people come out of freeze is they say, oh my God, my symptoms have gotten worse. And so they don't think they're recovering. But in fact, they are recovering because they're having symptoms. That's the good thing. They don't feel good, but at least they've come out of freeze and they're back into mobility. This is immobility. This is mobility. They're coming back alive, but the first stage of coming back alive doesn't feel pleasant. Now, the problem up here is that if people get stuck in this cycle, the longer they stay in here, the more they are apt to have suicidal ideation because they are living now either with no feelings or overwhelming feelings. Both are unbearable. And so they that's their only two options in life. And so often people will choose suicide or have suicidal ideation. It is during this time of this first stage of recovery, coming out of immobility into mobility in this first stage is when they're going to need some sort of co-regulation or a dialogue with somebody else who understands what they're going through and somebody else becomes their ground for them because they don't have their groundedness yet. So you become the ground and you help them regulate to go below this line where they now can regulate their own feelings. That's the first stage of recovery. Unfortunately, clinically, most people think that when people come back to their baseline, that then they have recovered. And that's partially true. What I want to talk about or what we want to discuss in, in this session today is stage two. Now, stage two is when you have you go through what's called a transformation point or reframing the experience or a point of a new perspective, or you're going from disillusion to evolution. This phase here is absolutely essential. Actually, this is the major phase for post-traumatic growth. This just helps us come back into an ego that feels safe and secure, but it doesn't produce some sort of reframing of this experience that was our, a difficult life experience. So this part two is what we want to talk about. So this is where post-traumatic growth occurs. When we come down back to our baseline, we actually have to reframe this experience. And reframing it means, how do I reinterpret this horrible experience in a way that it helped me grow as a human being? That is the post-traumatic growth process. Now, research has already demonstrated to us that people who go through this process, most people bounce back to their baseline. Okay, so this ex helps them stay in their baseline. However, some people emerge from disaster stronger and better, at least in some ways. So the question has to be, how did they get stronger and better from a disaster? Okay. Also, it shows that the grief experience, which happens here, you grieve this process, in some ways forces people to become different people, and that the new person is sometimes better than the old one. This suggests some sort of growth has come out of the trauma. And then the last one, which is intriguing, is it says, when the vagus nerve is highly stimulated, people report having had spiritual experiences. And I'll talk about that a little bit. But the vagus nerve is the baseline nerve, okay? 
So when this gets highly stimulated, people somehow go down into this depth, which many people call a spiritual experience. So I want to talk about this area here in the next slide. So here we have the transformation point, reframing the experience, the point of a new perspective, and we're moving from disillusion to evolution. Now, I want to show you a couple of people who have done this in their lives and demonstrated to humanity this is true and real, and every human person can access this depth of post-traumatic growth. The first one I'm going to talk about is Martin Luther King. And, oh, I'm sorry, let me talk about this first. Uh, I have to move something, okay. To truly transform the trauma from disillusion to evolution, to gain a new perspective as a human species for our human community, we must expand beyond ego consciousness. Ego consciousness only goes to the baseline. We need something to expand beyond ego consciousness. And we must access something beyond the ego, which includes something like our personal belief systems, such as mythology maybe, or spirituality, or our religious belief systems, consciousness, energy fields, chakras, whatever the person believes in, even if it's atheism and agnosticism, they have to draw on this to go beyond ego consciousness to transform a trauma experience into an evolutionary growth process. Okay, so now here's where I can show you um, Martin Luther King. Oops. Okay, so he, obviously he was he went through a lot of trauma. And he said, man or human beings must evolve for all human conflict, a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of such a method is love. Now, this man was murdered because he was speaking so powerfully a truth about humanity that it was not acceptable by other human beings. So we had to get rid of him because he was talking against revenge, aggression, and retaliation and speaking out about love. He also said, I have decided to stick with love because hate is too great a burden to bear. And this is our problem. If we only come down to here, our baseline, when we heal trauma and we don't transform we will not make some sort of profound change within my humanity as a human being that will benefit others of humanity. This man came to a point of a new perspective and he went to a point of evolution of our species where he said, I've decided to stick with love because hate is too great a burden to bear. This is powerful uh, messaging for us as human beings. The next one I want to talk about is Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela, when he was released from prison, said, as I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. He knew that inside himself was his prison. And his prison would be bitterness and hatred if he could not release it from in himself. It wasn't revenge. It wasn't justice. It wasn't trying to get back to the nation that imprisoned him for 27 years. It was, I have to free myself of my own bitterness and hatred, or I will still be in prison. And the way he did that was through forgiveness. He said, forgiveness liberates the soul. Forgiveness removes fear. That's why forgiveness is such a powerful weapon. Now, how many of us could possibly be in prison unjustly for most of our life, most of our young life, 
and not be bitter and hatred? How could we leave those behind? This man went through a transformation point within himself. He reframed his experience of prison, came out with a point of a new perspective, and that moved him from the disillusion of his prison experience to evolution. And that's the power of post-traumatic growth. If we dare ourselves to go deep enough inside to take the trauma, we come out with a message that's not only liberating for me, but a message that's liberating for humanity. And my last point here is about forgiveness, because that's very much misunderstood as well. This kind of forgiveness that he spoke about is not about seeking revenge or justice or righteousness or salvation from our victimhood. These behaviors are simply strong compulsions that continue to trap us in our ego consciousness. All of these things, revenge, justice, righteousness, salvation, they all are up here still. None of them are part of the human emotion that comes down to a growth point of an internal evolution. Forgiveness is not about forgiving someone. It's about living in a state of forgiveness because we are all enmeshed in the web of collective guilt that history has spun around humanity. This comes directly out of a book by Richard Holloway on forgiveness. It's an excellent book, but he reframes forgiveness to say, it is not about forgiving someone. It, that's the wrong way of looking at it. We are collectively, as a human species, living in a state where forgiveness, much like love, simply has to be the state of our being. Now, that, I believe, is the depth that we have to go to in post-traumatic growth that we don't talk about, we're afraid to talk about it. We don't understand it, but I don't believe we will transform the human species unless all of us who have been traumatized, which is everybody, dares ourselves to go that deep inside ourselves to come out with a new message that somehow really professes and expresses love and forgiveness. Fantastic. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing this. You're welcome. I hope it was okay. Yeah, it was great. Any thoughts, Simba? No yeah, thoughts? I was just laughing because yeah. I was still taking in all the information mm -hmm. and the energy transmission. It was beautiful. Yeah, I guess the, the main thing, you, you kind of already answered the question, but I get the question sometimes. If I go from the stage one of being in the overwhelm going from dorsal vagal to sympathetic if i come down to the green zone why do i continue to do the work why should i continue to do the work i feel good here but i guess that's like what you said that's working from the level of ego consciousness i feel good but not necessarily everyone around me and if not everyone around me feels good there will still be this nervous system insecurity among us and bouncing off each other do you care to elaborate yeah. a little bit on that? Yeah, I think you're right. We come back to a place where it's ego consciousness and say, oh, thank God that's over. I feel good now. I feel relaxed. But we're missing the biggest gem of the entire experience. It's not just getting over. It's like, all right, now let me go deep inside to see what. how is that going to make me grow as a human species? So I either never get caught in that experience again or I even know how to deal with that experience if it surfaces in my life again. And more importantly, every one of us, I believe, is compelled. We are driven in our humanness to want to seek deeper inside ourselves. And that happiness, that depth of peace is way beyond what we can get from that ego level. So when people say, well, thank God I feel peaceful now, I'm saying, wait, there is a greater depth of peace that you can achieve if you want to go looking for it. It's already there because you have all the data 
from the experience waiting to be unfolded and rearticulated by you. Yeah, this is so interesting. Um, I, I, I recently started to share like having trauma and re and 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 coming back from that is like being a seed planted in earth. It's like you dig your way up. It's dark. You don't know if you're going the right direction. You have no clue. But then all of a sudden you kind of break through. We're like, oh, I have arrived, you know. And then, oh, okay, then I can just lay in the grass and I'm done. Here's the sun. And oh, here's nice. While my, my idea is like, but now you're the seed that is sprouting and you can grow and you can, you know, reach for the sun, reach for the stars and, and kind of turn into this magnificent being and because i get that question so many times like why do you continue to to grow why do you why do you keep on this journey and and for me it's like because there's so much more there's just so yeah. much more i love that analogy and that's i think what we're supposed to be doing we're supposed to open up the avenue for people to be invited into that, not force them there or anything, but let them know that's available, that they can speak to us about that, that we even tease them a little bit to go in that direction to see if they're ready for that. But I believe that's our gift as TRE providers to humanity is not just helping them recover from the trauma, but inviting them into transformation formative experience from that trauma yeah yeah definitely and the the best way that i feel that we can do that is to talk about it like this and to yeah. show because the people who are following us they've been following us for a long time and they see the progress they see the transformation they see how we change and how we grow and how we change and how we express ourselves and the magnetism and the the love and the transformation. Yeah. Every time we give a presentation on TRE, I think we need to bear a little bit of our soul so that they hear a little bit at a time how we're speaking from a depth that they're saying, wow, I, I never heard that before. I never heard it that way before. So we're not just giving them instructions. We're inviting them to explore a little bit deeper in their soul. Yeah. And I think that's the real transformation process. Hmm. And I love how you bring spirituality into it. That that's like the next point. It's like it's a it's a step that is needed because we need to go more in depth into the body and to understand what's actually going on. Because it's just a superficial level. It's still on an external level, it feels like. Yeah. Almost. Yeah, that's a little tough one because I have to use something like belief systems because I do want to include atheists and agnostics because I have many friends who are either atheists or agnostic, but I know they still reflect deeply about their own existence in life. Mm. So it's not spirituality because they would reject that word because they don't believe yeah. they have one, but they do accept that, yes, I question why I'm here, what life is about, what my value or my meaning is for, and how am I in relationship with the rest of humanity? Yeah. So in that sense, every one of us is almost compelled or moved to keep seeking deeper within ourselves for deeper happiness and peacefulness of our existence on the planet. And truth, I feel. Yeah. Yes, our own individual truths. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah, I, th I think the way that you explained the the uh, the scale and you know the the post traumatic growth, uh, I was just kind of like shaking my head the whole time because it, it feels like the exact um, transformation that has happened to me, uh, ha having experienced a, a violent and traumatic um, childhood and adulthood. I, I did spend quite a few years in that you know from the blue zone to the red zone and being just so terrified and afraid and the suicidal ideation and. That's a very difficult place to be in because it's not easy to talk about. And suicide is one of those things that is kind of like a something that that isn't you know easily shared with other people. Um, so having now come out of that down into the spiritual experience and you know having this post traumatic growth, looking at life from a new way, loads of forgiveness, loads of of love and gratitude. Um, I think that that now is a superpower 
for me to be able to help and co-regulate and guide people who are floating around in that suicidal ideation period of this process. Um, and yeah, I think that when you mentioned co-regulation is the key to get people out of that, I think that's exactly what we do as TRE providers and also, you know, kind of our mission at Living with the Spirit for how we best help people. I think that word superpower really is perfect. We do have some sort of superpower of the depth of our humanness when we've gone there. It's down there waiting for us to access it. And when we do, and you speak to somebody who's up in level one, boy, they're drawn to that. Yeah. That's why I think we need to really let people know that nobody talks about level one of recovery because we can't talk about suicidal ideation. We absolutely must talk about it, particularly for the teenage generation where there's huge amounts of that right now. And we have to talk. We have to talk about it from level two. Yeah. See, that's what will draw them. If we talk to them <laughs> from that from the ego level. We have nothing to offer them, honestly, and they can feel that, they can sense that. But if you profoundly speak from the depth of yourself, that person who's thinking of suicide is going to say, I want to go there. Can you yeah. get me to that place where you are? That's all I want. And that helps draw them out of there. Isn't it also the fact that the body communicates to the other body so it's not yeah. only the mind yeah. so the body can feel wow yes. if you can go there i can go there because we're the same <laughs> exactly right our species <laughs> does co-regulate Stephen poor just talks about that all the time we are not a species of individuals we're a co-regulated species and you actually can feel you can you already can feel it my passion my desire my uh, desperate attempt to try to speak a truth within myself. It may be limited by words, but the expression of my energy mm -hmm. and my emotion is not limited. It's pouring out. And when people feel that, they're moved by that deeply. Would you say that that's one of the entrances or connections to unity consciousness, that that's like how we are connected through the nervous system and through this yeah, I think Stephen Porges would probably say that's the only connection um, is, is that our nervous systems are co-regulated towards each other, almost like we are not individuals. We are a species. We are one species of humanity. And just like the hundredth monkey, even if I just make a transformation myself, someone somewhere else in this world is going to sense or feel that and be supported by that. So, and that's a good point, Sarah. We have to take away the consciousness that I'm just doing this in me or for me, or I'm alone in my house doing it by myself. No, if I have a breakthrough of consciousness, humanity has the breakthrough. Yeah, and so that counts. collective consciousness is important for us to have to feel that we are connected as a species. I think that's really important for the level one when you're in that suicidal that you matter. Yeah. That it's, yeah. That, it's that everyone counts, you know, everyone when, matters. When I do level one or when I used to do them, I would have people tremoring like the first day. And then the second day, I'd say, okay, yesterday you all tremored as individuals to explore your own bodies. Now while you're tremoring, I want to I want you to try to see. Can you feel the group tremoring? Can you feel that you're tremoring with a whole species of people? And can you feel yourself individual? And can you move back and forth between the two? And it's just a challenge. It's not that they can do it. I don't care about that. But it was bringing to consciousness to say, I'm standing here looking at 30 people vibrate on the floor, and I'm moving back and forth between individuals and a collective vibration that's going on in the room. And and I can sense that, actually. And sometimes the whole group can get that sensation. And then they can feel like, wow, we activated individually. And at some point, collectively, we were one organism vibrating on the floor. That's amazing. And I mean, as a TRE provider, I mean, you see it in big groups. I've seen it, too people that don't know each other, they're not looking at each other, 
when some, someone starts to tremor, you can see this exact same pattern appear in the next person, the next person. So it's more than conceptual, really. You know, you can see it physically. Like they don't know each other. They might not speak the same language. They don't even see each other. And they move identical at the same time. That's a perfect example of which we could do research on is how does this organism affect this organism? How does this vibrational frequency activate this vibration, vibrational frequency identically? And you've seen it a lot. I've seen a lot. Many TRE providers have seen it a lot. So evidence, experiential evidence is demonstrating, yes, that's a reality. We are actually affecting one another. Whether we see each other, speak each other's languages or not, we are affecting one another. And I think that vibration in TRE is a profoundly important um, quality in built into the human person that has not been well recognized by medical science or psychology. And it is an essential component, I think, of the nervous system to help with co-regulation. Hmm. So I saw you were, maybe that was just as a form of explaining, but you were kind of doing like an undercurve there that the, because when mm -hmm. we present the curve in the theory community, we kind of have baseline, sympathetic, dorsal vagal, and then back down. But I kind of right. got an idea that you were hinting there is more to it. Yeah, I'm trying to just, the undercurve was just to say we can go deeper than just the baseline. And that's deeper inside our humanity. Mm -hmm deeper into the experience of the trauma than what the baseline has brought us to. The baseline brought us to reconciling it, accepting it. It's okay. I lived through it. I survived. But I'm saying that's not transformative at all. And you, since you collected all that data from the abuse of the trauma, you've got it all. Now take it down deeper and use it to become that superpower um, that Mark just mentioned. So is that more of a personal growth or are there, I, I don't like to say stages because then it kind of goes into belief system again. But if we have like the, the ventral vagal, the sympathetic and dorsal vagal, how would that even start to look like in terms of traits or qualities or how can, I, how can you start to recognize that someone is is coming down below the baseline? Yeah, it's usually in the way that they inhabit themselves or move or speak. There's a quality, a softness, a depth that they're not just speaking at a, a superficial level of ego. They're reflective in what they're saying. Um, they're reflective in their questioning even. And I have found this is very interesting when I work with large traumatized populations they can collectively go through this. They can go through collectively what that experience of war is doing to them as a community or as an organization or as a family, that the whole group starts to go down into that level. And that's what I think is going to start changing humanity, not just individuals doing it, but we do it collectively. That's why I think it's very important for us to both speak about it and to do that journey ourselves, because if we don't, people are going to know he or she's not down there. That's nice words they're saying, but I don't get a sense that that's where they're living from. They'll be able to pick up on that mm -hmm. easily. Yeah, embodying that. Our own yeah. yeah. I mean, do, actually embodying it. I mean, there's a saying like you can't take anyone else further than you have come yourself. Exactly. So it's like... Yeah. At a point, it becomes talk, and if it's not embodiment, yeah. the other body doesn't. It 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 has nothing. No reference point. It's yes, like, it has nothing to resonate towards. No, it's not. It's like it can't gravitate towards something. Yeah, so then perfect. it stays there. Yeah. Mm. Good. That's so exciting. This. Yeah. I see. I have questions, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Not not so many questions, but just re realizations, and um, you know, th this idea that we're all so deeply rooted and connected to each other means that we really do have the ability to change humanity if, if we're all connected through our nervous systems, kind of kind of like this neurological matrix. 
then you know when 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 one when one person kind of lights up and sticks their head out and says, "Hey, I'm alive over here," and then the nervous systems around them are kind of like, "Oh, hey, I want to I want to see what's up here too," and and then it just kind of can distribute across the whole world that way. And I think that that's such a beautiful way of thinking. It's such a positive way of thinking that, I mean, I've, I've almost gotten there, but today the, the final little dot disconnected in my mind. And I, I feel just so inspired by what you've shared. So at, at the, I'm like, I'm on fire with this talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was interviewing Stephen Portis the other day, and he said, all you have to do is produce safety. If you produce safety within yourself, every human organism is going to let down their guard and move towards you. Some of them might be frightened still, okay, because we could be afraid of safety if we're still living in a, um, uh, a frozen state. But a lot of people will be drawn to that because that's what our nervous system is looking for, safety. Once it has safety, the entire mechanism of the human organism begins to change. And so he's really strong about that. And I like the example he made. He even mentioned the movie, The Matrix, you know, the digitalized world living in a fictional reality. He said, well, change that digitalized world to threat cues. And then you really get, you know, the blue zone you were talking about where people live from that. We have this threat and competitiveness that makes us afraid. Like, I don't want to start. You should start. <laughs> and, then, right. and then everyone is bouncing their fear kind of against each other. Right. That's why I think that if we expose a little bit of our soul, we say something of wisdom, something reflective and thoughtful every time we give a, a training or a presentation in TRE, we're automatically signaling to them we're safe. See, we'll talk at this level. I've exposed mm -hmm. something about myself to a group of people who don't even know me, which means I feel safe. I was safe enough to share it and invite them to feel safe enough to reply at that level. Vulnerability, right? That you're, Absolutely. you're safe enough to show mm -hmm. your weak spots or which is yeah. actually your strengths. Exactly right, yeah. And I think that's imperative if we are going to transform the human species. Because like you said, quoting Stephen Porges, the whole world is full of terror and threat and everyone's looking consciously and everyone's ego is designed at a very high level of activation. And all you need to do is have somebody down here who says, well, we don't have to be that afraid. We're okay. We're going to do fine. We're going to survive this. Let's take a deep breath together. And then we just help their nervous system come down because it's at this stage that we will transform humanity, not up here. We're not going to do it from the threat level. So what parts do you, in your experience, because you, you, in the beginning, before we started, you said this might trigger some people. Mm -hmm. Like what, what is it that you experience that is triggering? Okay, so think of a couple things. Somebody will say, I was so abused as a child, I could never forgive somebody for that, what they did to me. Uh, that's a tough one. I understand that. That's hard to say, oh, you need to forgive them. That's why I don't believe that's the level that I'm going at. Um, I'm saying, no, you, you want to live in a state of forgiveness because otherwise you're going to be like Nelson Mandela said. You're going to be in your own internal mm -hmm. prison if you refuse to somehow embrace Forgiveness as an energy, not as something you give to somebody. I don't think that's the right way to do it. It makes an upper or lower person. It's about, wait, humanity has been cruel and mean because it's been threatened and afraid. We live in a state where we have to embrace the energy field or vibrational frequency of forgiveness. That's mm -hmm. all. Everybody's in it. The other thing is, like we were talking about spirituality. People say, well, I'm an atheist. I don't have a spirituality. Okay, that'll trigger them to say, well, this has no meaning for me. It does have meaning for them because you're human and you reflect on humanity. See, so those are kind of the little triggers that people, when they're afraid, they're going to nitpick those <laughs> triggers as a way of not embracing going down that deep. I want to respect that too, but I want to have an answer to that as well. Um, uh, when people bring those up and say, well, how could you forgive the Holocaust as an example? Okay. So 
they're always going to bring up something like that. And that's what we have to say. No, I, we're talking about forgiveness in a completely different level here. And it's a, for your own humanity is why you're, you're seeking out a depth of forgiveness that the ego does not understand. And I believe that as a energy being, exactly. every one of us knows that's in there, whether we want to accept that or believe it, or whether we're ready to exercise that or not is a different issue, but it's in the human species. Yeah, it feels like it's a, it's almost, if, if we don't talk about forgiving a certain person or event or, or just using the, the, the concept of forgiveness, almost like an alchemy, like you're, you're, yes. you're in an alchemy in, inside and like, oh, I have a lot of this bitterness. Let me add a little bit uh, of, of forgiveness and see if this feels better. Because it's it's about how you experience the world. The world is a feeling. It's like, I usually call it your life experience. How is your life experience? Like, instead of taking the drug to change my life experience, I can also take this gratitude or love or forgiveness to add into yeah. the mix. And I don't think we have a choice, honestly, as a species. We're going to have to do this. If not, we just keep recycling our violence. But at some point, we've got to choose as a species, like Martin Luther King said, I'm choosing love. That's it. I don't care what it produces. I don't care how people are affected by it. That's my choice, personally, and my contribution to the human species. I can invite you to choose the same thing, but I cannot make you make that choice. But if you read some of these other prophetic people who have had transformative experiences, they will tell you at some point we will destroy our species if we don't choose the right way to be in relationship with one another. Yeah. I believe even the four of us can do our little bit, which is a lot more than we think, by just simply challenging ourselves to live in a state of forgiveness and love every day of our life. Now, that's not easy. I'm not saying I do it all the time, but I'm saying there are moments when I contribute that to the planet consciously. Yeah. 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 It's a practice. Yeah. And it also feels like the ego has that story, you know, that sense of separation, like, okay, I can forgive someone for the, what they did for me, but I can never forgive them if they do something to a loved one. It's kind of, it's looking for a way out. It's looking for, but what if, but what if? Yeah. But I think it comes back to what you were saying with energetical beings. I mean, you got to realize when you're projecting something to that person, you're doing the same thing to yourself. You know, there is yeah. really no difference. Yeah, it's all internal. Whatever we're thinking or feeling is affecting us. And so it's like, we've got to work on this internal journey, um, no matter what the external world has done. It's still all the resolution comes from the internal journey. Yeah, it's a choice of this happened and now what? How, what, what do I choose yeah. forward? How and do I, I mean, respond to it? Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's, I mean, it, we have to respect. And that's why we say, you know, living with the spirit, mm -hmm. it's not about we're telling what your truth is. We don't, that's completely your own thing. We just mm -hmm. guide you back to your truth and whatever level yeah. that is. Yes. Because we're all different everyone. levels in our journey. I can't be angry at somebody because they can't accept my level or I can't embrace their level because they've done more inner work than I have. It's like, just respect. All I'm saying is that for us as TRE providers, let's open the door and make available the opportunity for discussions at that level if people can go there. Yeah, because there's so much opportunity. And I feel like uh, when I share this about wanting more, going for more, uh, that i mean i'm from sweden we're not allowed to say that that's not that's not socially accepted to say that i want more and then we have texas over here <laughs> <laughs> more is better you know like this it's so interesting where we come from 
But yeah, it, cultures are very different. Exactly. And yeah. so I when I was teaching TRE all over the world, I had to delicately respect the culture that I was living in because I did things like work with Palestinians and Israelis. And that was a real balancing act. And then with the northern and southern Sudanese, when they were at war with one another and Eritreans and Ethiopians, all of that was like a balancing act. But Mother Teresa taught me really well. I worked with her a little bit in the past. And she said, David, you just go in there and you look at a human being. You're not looking at a politics. You're not looking at a religion. If they're suffering, your job is to see them as a suffering human being and get rid of everything else and just love the individual that's in front of you. That was it. And that was really helpful for me because one day I'd be working with Palestinians that had suffered from Israeli uh, a, a aggression. The next day I'd be working for, with Israelis who suffered from Palestinian aggression. And I had to keep dropping all this aggressive behavior so I could stay neutral and just really try to love the human being and their suffering that was in front of me, not what caused it or what's right or just or true. How do I help the human being simply get through that? Yeah. I believe that that's the absolute key. That's what we have to do as a species. We have yeah. to do this. It's like going, it's like if I look at the person in front of me through a nervous system and with no bias or judgment yeah. and I come from a place of love and mm -hmm. I don't take whatever happened personally if they, you know, go in and out through the level one. Right. Then I can just hold that space and. Yeah, that's all. Our job is really quite simple. It's just to be in ourselves. When they can resonate to that, they'll come towards it. Yeah. If that resonance is too strong and too frightening, then they can't come towards it. And I want to respect that as well. I just want to simply be available and let them know I'm available with that resonance when they come. There's a lot of talk in the vibrational physics field right now that we don't, as trauma uh, people, we don't heal anybody. We simply vibrate as a certain resonance and frequency that if they can match the frequency, they can heal themselves. Yeah. If they can't match the frequency, we just be patient with them until they can. Yeah. Yeah. And we all, people gravitate to, I, I truly believe that the people who are supposed to work with you, they will gravitate towards you because yeah. there's something within your resonance that, that resonates with them. Yeah. In, in if it's in the story or if it's in the I don't know it it right that's why we keep sharing on podcasts like this we're simply sending out our our resonance our vibrational frequency and if people can respond to it they'll seek you out if they can't they'll say well that was crazy or I didn't like that or I don't think he's right whatever and that's fine with me too it's like, this is just my journey, my story, my attempt at um, trying to grasp the depth of my humanness and my participation in the family of humanity. That's all I'm doing. I love that. Okay. I feel like I'm in a training. This has been <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm actually a part of this. <laughs> so Good. Good. So, so if I'm watching this and I might be quite new to a lot of these concepts or just started working, what would you say is a good point to start embracing it, right? Because everyone has walked different amounts of steps and done different amounts of healing or discovering themselves. What, where would yes. it be a good point to kind of, wow, I like what he said. Where do I go from here? Yeah, well, I found that people generally come to me from three different dimensions. They either come to me because they want to talk and they don't want to do body work, or they come to me because they want to do body work and they don't want to talk, or they come to me because they want some sort of reflective spiritual guidance because they don't want to do body work and or talking. They want to reflect on something. But from any one of those three points, 
If I stay with them on it, it will move us to the next point and the next point until all three integrate. So for the person who's listening to this, where's your starting point? Go there because that's where your energy and excitement is going to be. And as you satisfy that starting point, it will then open up the next step for you to go to and then the next step. So everyone should start where they're most moved to start. And that could be in different different places inside their life. Is that helpful? That's super helpful, definitely. I mean, it's very clear and kind of gives an idea of how I can move between different dimensions. And I definitely noticed this as well as a body worker. I do a lot of um, non-touch therapies, if we name it yeah. like that. And I realize as soon as we start to do body work, there's a whole new layer of yeah. safety, connection, vulnerability. You hear the softness in their voice. They start to share something that's way more profound than we could ever just talk about if we just met and did. Right. So so there are definitely levels that kind of goes together. Yeah. And that's our goal is to allow the easy a facilitation among the different levels because you could go from talking into body work and then that transforms back into talking again because we need to do that several times and then that might lead to the question of what does all this mean you know why why am i feeling this in my heart or why did i cry with happiness yesterday then they're starting to ask a deeper question see so our job is just to be uh, flexible enough to allow them to move through those different realms of their humanity um, and constantly facilitating them to go deeper in wherever they're at, at the current moment. Yeah, this is really helpful. Sometimes people ask me, what do you do? And I kind of go, oh, but this is really a you know, very good description of how I see what I will do. I'll move between different uh, stages of being, uh, perceptions and also different parts of your journey i like that different parts of your journey to your humanness like you said right exactly because i went through all of those actually i went through just talking to a therapist for a couple of years then i went quit that went to straight body work then i went to talk to a spiritual director for a couple of years and then i began to see wow they're all really related to one another i just did them all as individual processes at different times, but in the end, they all showed me how they all joined up together. Yeah. So I think all humanity uh, does that process. Yeah. And um, we talked a little bit before we <clears throat> pressed the record button about the connection between TRE and Kundalini energy. Do you have mm -hmm. anything to share about that from your experience? Yeah. Here's the issue about that. Um, kundalinis or chakras or meridian lines, all that sort of stuff, they're all belief systems. And so if somebody comes to me and they feel that the tremoring is, is opening their chakras and helping their kundalini energy to rise, I will follow that because that's their belief system. I will not impose mm -hmm. something to say, oh, yes, that is, or no, that isn't. I would say, well, that's great. Let's follow it through. Keep me informed as to what's going on because I want to reinforce their belief system because the problem with that, if somebody doesn't believe in that, then they're going to think that this tremor mechanism in TRE isn't for them. The tremor mechanism is for the human organism, everyone, no matter what their belief system is. So I try to stay neutral, but supportive of all of them. Very helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. All righty. Yeah. Well, that was good. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you so good. much for joining, for coming back. And uh, yeah, we wish you all the best and uh, looking forward to our next encounter whenever that will be. Okay, great. If I get to Thailand, mm -hmm. I will give you a call, let you know I'm on my way. Yep. And we'll see what we can do. It'll be fun. Yeah, that would be great. You're super okay. invited. Thank you so much. Take, Take care. You. Nice Take care. to meet all of you. Nice to meet you, Mark. Thank you. Nice to meet you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.